Great. I am, I am really excited to be here, and I really appreciate the op opportunity to be here and for everyone participating. I am really uh, thankful for your time and to engage and be part of this important uh, topic discussion. So I just want to start by sharing a little bit about my interest and really my deep commitment to, to survivorship, which comes from my experience, as Dan mentioned, as a clinical social worker at Dana-Farber. My first job at Dana-Farber, I worked I worked in GYN oncology, and I left um, after being in that position for four and a half years to go back to school. And when I returned, um, I worked uh, in the adult survivorship program. And what really surprised me um, within my first few weeks of being uh, working with patients and families post-treatment was how similar the stories were to the women and families I was working with who were in active treatment. So the, the concerns, the struggles, uh, the relationship challenges, the work issues, not sleeping, feeling worried about the future, these were remarkably similar. And I share this to say that while I certainly think we've made a lot of progress in recognizing uh, the big picture needs of cancer survivors, I believe that we really have a lot to do, a lot more to do about meeting, um, about meeting the needs. Uh, so we, we understand that they're there, but I don't think we've quite figured out how to, how to meet them. So for our time together, I'm gonna to start with some big picture information about cancer survivorship, psychosocial issues, and fear of cancer occurrence. And then I'm gonna share a little bit of information about a study I led um, trying to understand fear of cancer occurrence, um, and if it's like some other maybe similar constructs or if it's more unique um, and being its own separate thing. And then we'll spend a little time talking about fear of cancer recurrence interventions and treatment some tips on how to manage uh, uncertainty and fear, and then some next steps that are happening uh, with the field. So um, let's start with uh, some definitions so we all know that we're talking about the same thing. So uh, NCCS has really been at the forefront, uh, I think starting in the mid-80s, about really defining cancer survivorship as being this broad experience across the cancer continuum. Um, I think they also were sort of leaders, including patients uh, families and their friends and their loved ones in this definition of cancer survivor too. So living with, through, and beyond a cancer diagnosis. Um, I think they also um, have been leaders in sort of acknowledging the trouble with the definition or just having label for anything also, I think sometimes just presents some struggles. And that individuals have different ideas of what a survivor might be. So for some people, it's I need to I, when my doctor tells me I am, um, that's when I'm a survivor. For some people, it's the first day of diagnosis. Uh, it's re reaching some five-year benchmark. And some people really dislike the term, but it sort of uh, reminds them of things that they don't associate with being a cancer survivor. Um, and so I just want to be clear to say up front that I really believe that being a cancer survivor is a is a term that you can use or not use. I think it's personal. Um, and in my opinion, it's very much up to individuals on what um, he or she wants to use, but for research and being able to talk about um, a group of people together, labels can be important. And so for the rest of this sort of conversation, when I talk about cancer survivors and survivorship research, I'm using ASCO's definition, which is really focused on individuals who have successfully completed treatment. So people who have finished um, treatment, they might still be on some sort of pro prophylactic therapy, but for the most part, active treatment has ended. Um, so survivorship, I think, really uh, started getting a lot of uh, a lot of attention in the mid 2000s when a big Institute of Medicine report came out, and that really started identifying a lot of shortfalls in survivorship care. Um, it highlighted consequences of cancer treatment and a, a complete, I think, lack of awareness. Uh, I think providers and patients were so uh, pleased to get to the survivorship point at that transition point of ending active treatment. Um, and, and really, uh, I think this report also prior prior prioritized quality of life and psychosocial care. Um, and it coincided with these national recommendations and guidelines uh, that really uh, included psychosocial issues in the management of late and long-term effects. Um, fast forward uh, eight or nine years, and another report comes out um, from the Institute of Medicine that is highlighting uh, very related issues, but across the can cancer continuum, that care isn't um, often not patient-centered, it's not high quality, often is the case, and really hitting home the, the importance of including psychosocial concerns and survivorship uh, when we conceptualize and think about 
um, patient-centered care and high quality of care. I think this report also highlighted the importance of survivorship research and paying attention and making sure we weren't leaving uh, post-treatment um, people from, from how we were um, envisioning high quality care. So uh, within the context of these two reports um, in the background, we have this rapidly growing and then projected to be very, very large population of cancer survivors. So it even further accentuates the, you know, our need and the importance of making sure we're addressing a very large population of people. So now I'm going to turn just to the cancer continuum because this has been around in different iterations, but since the mid-70s. And I think like the label survivor itself, uh, these buckets um, are sort of the best we have, but maybe don't fully, ex maybe it's a sort of oversimplified uh, description of sort of cancer care and control. Um, and I think I showed this just to say that I think it can be a useful framework, but I think the more we learn about survivorship, and I think this is true with fear of cancer occurrence and psychosocial issues in general, is that survivorship really um, and I think more and pe more people are talking about it this way, is going to be included in this cross-cutting area that survivorship starts at the moment of diagnosis and continues on. Um, so just like the individual survivor having that um, uh, sort of that identity from the time of diagnosis forward, I think survivorship care, I think, is entering in the same, in the same direction. And I think that's, um, I think that's important just to keep in the background as we move forward. So I love this slide. Um, for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that I think this was often the hope or sort of what we projected or tried to achieve when patients were finishing um, chemotherapy. So at the institution I worked at, um, oftentimes when people, um, when patients had their final day of chemotherapy, they were presented with freckling titer, sometimes a muffin or a cupcake with a candle in it, um, some clapping and cheering, and, and families and friends and loved ones came. and. Um, I think the more that I heard about that day from people post-treatment, the, the clearer it became the incongruence that often was felt in varying degrees, but I think was felt by most people. And this idea that we should be celebrating when often people are feel very uncertain about what the future holds or what's next, or I've been coming here with this plan for the last three months or the last um, you know, six months and now I'm not coming back for how long? It's um, unsettling and I think it's a complicated sort of range of feelings. And there's research that, that reflects this as well. There was some qualitative work that was done um, a while ago, but it sort of highlighted these myths of ending treatment, that there are these expectations that people felt that I should be celebrating now, I should feel well now, I should be back to my precancer self, I shouldn't need support anymore, that these were messages that people were um, internalizing that of what they thought their future should be like, but what they actually were feeling um, was that they were falling, I like this image too, but that, that they were falling off a cliff, that sort of there's a lot of uncertainty ahead of them, they weren't sure when and where they were going to land, and I like these little bits of debris because I think people are falling and then they're getting hit with things um, as they go, and sometimes they're bigger things and sometimes they're smaller things, but uh, the uncertainty of knowing sort of where you're going and what's coming and falling after you, I think, remains for lots of people. And a lot of these things are um, anxiety, perhaps it's a new sort of anxiety, it's a persisting anxiety, um, people having feelings of post-traumatic stress uh, that gets triggered by um, a, a scan appointment, the smell of the paper towels in the bathroom, um, that often can be very triggering for people, uh, relationship difficulties, returning to work, uh, relationships being different, or you don't feel as competent in your work tasks, and then sort of this overall quality of life are, are really, uh, I think, very big challenges that I think complicate people's um, or sort of affect the different pathways that people arrive at some level of fear of cancer recurrence. The next two slides are um, statements from uh, survivors, from, from, some, from some colleagues at Dana-Farber that I feel like really highlight uh, clearly the experiences that a lot of patients and families shared with me. And this is from a prostate survivor. And he says, no one warn, warned me that once treatment was over, everything would change. I was like a rock star while I was having treatment, then poof. I've been dropped off the map and no one seems to care much anymore. And then this is from a leukemia a leukemia survivor who's about um, a little less than a year out of treatment. 
And she says, it's hard for me to tell my family that I'm so afraid. They are all celebrating that I'm done. I can't tell them I get so terrified I can barely breathe. How do I explain that I now live in an in-between time? So these feelings of sort of uncertainty and wondering about the future um, are honestly ubiquitous. I don't think there's probably any uh, or a, a rare a rare cancer survivor who doesn't sort of endorse at some point having some level of fear. And I think the tricky thing with fear fear of cancer occurrence may be different than than other um, other psychosocial issues is that. It's, um, it's not abnormal, it's not unexpected. In fact, it's the exact op opposite, that you know, feelings of vulnerability, uh, a sense of loss about the future, worry about your life, your family's life, it's all extremely normal and it should be expected. However, it can be troublesome and disruptive and get in the way of living a life that, um, living a life that you want. Um, so despite it being an extremely common problem, I think for some, it's an, it's an even more uh, complicated experience. And so from a research perspective, some of, the, some of these complications um, of trying to really even understand what fear of cancer recurrence is in a way to study it is there have been lots of different definitions until very recently, and I'll share in a minute what the, the current sort of agreed upon definition is. There's also related, these, relatedly been lots of different measurement tools. So a lot of different ways that people try to measure um, if you have this or you don't have that. Um, and because of these things, the prevalence, how, how many people feel like they have fear of cancer recurrence has been, been very difficult to, to determine. And we've sort of developed these um, may, that they may be arbitrary sort of levels of, of fear. So um, this statistic says between 22 and 87 percent, which is a huge range, um, of cancer survivors with different diagnoses, different cancer experiences, report some level of moderate to high uh, fear of cancer occurrence. Uh, so the current definition is fear, worry, or concern relating to the possibility that cancer will come back or progress. And I was sort of alluding to this earlier. I think within that definition is this idea that FCR is um, a multidimensional construct, that it's um, that theoretically and conceptually um, researchers and I think people with fear of cancer recurrence would say it's not just anxiety, it actually isn't just me feeling distressed, it, it is more complicated than that. And researchers are trying to say, well, what, what, what are these other factors that might be sort of making fear of cancer recurrence be distinct? And so these are triggers, severity, um, psychological distress, so distress is a part of it, but doesn't explain all of it, um, how individuals cope, any functioning Im impairments, uh, level of insight, and, and need for reassurance. Relatedly, um, but separate, um, are uh, these clinical characteristics, and what clinical means is sort of a level where we become, uh, where uh, a provider would become concerned or there is a level of day-to-day -day disruption in life that requires some level of intervention. Um, so like I was saying, some fear of cancer occurrence, maybe that's okay, maybe it's not that bothersome to an individual, but at some point the, there's an increase or it, it becomes bothersome in the day-to-day -day life and then would require or we would hope that there would be something to do to help alleviate the degree of bother um, in the day-to-day. -day like interruption is what I mean by bother, like you're not able to do the things that you want to do with your life. And so some of these uh, components include here these five categories of uh, functional impairments, difficulties making future plans, excessive distress, uh, maladaptive coping, and then these high levels of worry or intrusive thoughts. Also, uh, the prior work has been uh, inconsistent because of these measurement issues that I talked about with um, what are um, associations or predictors or certain groups or experiences that might put people at higher risk for higher levels of fear. So higher levels of um, where we would be concerned like clinically about someone's day-to-day -day, day -day living, like they're not able to do the things that they want to do. And these, what I put on this slide, are things that are, are more consistent in the literature, but 
for every few studies that say one thing, there's a few studies that say something else. And that has everything to do with how it's defined, how fear of cancer is defined and how it's measured. So I would say most consistent in the literature as a whole is younger age. And so in most cancer diagnoses, younger people who are younger tend to, re, tend to be at higher risk, tend to report higher fear of cancer recurrence more than people who are older. Um, and that's true also for people with lower education. Uh, so medical factors, and again, these findings are mixed, are people who've had a prior reoccurrence, <clears throat> excuse me, um, people, uh, depending on the severity of their treatment, and also people who are having current uh, physical symptoms also tend to report higher fear of cancer recurrence, which makes sense because they're, tr they're often triggers. So if you have an ache or a pain, you're not feeling well, for most people who have cancer, that is a trigger to feeling concerned about something changing in your body or something that you need to pay attention to. Some psychosocial factors include communication. Um, so people who are communicating more with their pro providers tend to have higher fear. Um, if there's some family um, distress or some family struggle, that tends to be reflective of people with higher fear of cancer occurrence. A prior history of depression and anxiety, people with fewer uh, social supports. And, and interestingly, and this is, an, again, a consistent finding, but in a couple of studies, people who are very optimistic also tended to have high fear. And we can talk a little bit more about that um, in the Q&A, if you'd like. So uh, in the study that I worked on, um, there was this gap in that we didn't really have any po US population-based estimates that really examined um, fear of cancer occurrence and its association with other things, like the stress, depression, and anxiety. So how much is fear of cancer occurrence, again, its own um, kind of unique construct, or is it similar to something else? And so I um, use the MAPS experience, uh, <clears throat> me, the MAPS experience with cancer uh, data set, which um, is publicly available data, and it was a collaborative project between a number of uh, national agencies, and it's a nationally representative survey, which means we get uh, population-based estimates. Um, the sample I used included um, adults who were 18 years or older, uh, cancer survivors who had completed active treatment. Um, there are people who did not report a history of a cancer recurrence, and I included all cancers, at uh, all diagnoses in all stages. The measure um, of fear of cancer recurrence that was in the survey is this question, how often do you worry that your cancer may come back or get worse? And then there are these five, uh, five options. Um, the outcomes of interest were um, uh, depressive symptoms, uh, severe psychological distress, and then mental health status. And for the analysis portion, um, we uh, calculated population-based uh, proportions and 95% confidence intervals for a variety of sociodemographic um, and other characteristics. And then I'll sort of explain a little bit what uh, multivariable, multinomial logistic regression is. So this is the level of among those who responded in the survey that were included, um, and these are population-based estimates. Um, these are the proportion of people who uh, reported no, low, and high fear of cancer occurrence. So 34% reported no fear of cancer occurrence, 54% reported low, and 11% reported high. And then these um, odds ratios really are, is another way to think about it is um, thinking about it as risk. So um, people at higher odds are having higher risk, like three times the odds. Um, so, see if this will, so I just to put added two circles at the bottom. Um, and if, uh, if you just want to look at those, so unadjusted means that nothing else was in the model. These are just the relationship between um, low and high FCR compared to no FCR on this measure of mental health status. Um, and then that, a relationship, that significant relationship persisted when the fully adjusted model. And fully adjusted means we put a lot of other things in the model like age, race, ethnicity, marital status, and there's a list there at the bottom of the screen um, of all the variables that we controlled for. Um, and why this is interesting is there, there appears, so for depressive symptoms and psychological distress, 
um, there there are no significant effects between between depressive symptoms or psychological distress on the risk of reporting high or low FCR. So there's no um, basically there's no significant relationship, which adds to uh, I think this literature that um, excuse me uh, that these are uh, that fear of cancer recurrence is distinct from depression and distress. Uh, mental health status, this SF12 measure, is more of a global measure, more uh, maybe a quality of life, which is maybe why we're seeing more of a relationship, um, which actually may even be more reflective of, of a multidimensional construct. Oh. Um, and some other characteristics um, of increased risk for fear of cancer recurrence included these, and the, and the statistics are a little complicated here because there's a lot of comparators, but I'll, I'll say it how it is, and if you, if you have questions, we can, we can certainly try to unpack that a little bit. So people who were one to five years since diagnosis compared to people who were five, more, five or more years out from diagnosis reported uh, were more likely to report low and high FCR compared to no FCR. And then the good health status, the comparator there is people reporting um, very good or excellent health status. So there, there's a um, one point, almost one and a half the odds of reporting low FCR. And then also very consistent with the literature are latent long-term effects. So people who are experiencing latent long-term effects compared to people not experiencing any later long-term effects um, are uh, almost two and four times the odds of reporting low and high FCR compared to no. So the implications of the study really um, are a few things, but um, it's really the first study that is providing very much needed population-based estimates on predictors of low and high FCR. So the other literature, I mean, this is all sort of, uh, literature is just sort of a pebble on the pile, and we're trying to get more and more information so we can better understand something and then hopefully all the purpose of all of that is really to how do we best target and support and help people who are who are having difficulty with fear of cancer recurrence. Um, it also suggests, like I mentioned, that fear of cancer recurrence may be distinct from depression and distress, which is also adding to this body of literature about looking at um, FDRs as, as a multidimensional construct. And then finally, we really do need more research to better understand fear of cancer recurrence not just from this study, but like from from many many studies, so so we know who who needs the, who needs our help the most, and how we're trying to sort of target them and make sure they're getting access. So, what are um, FCR interventions? Um, so, there um, are a number of different I think skills and therapies that are being utilized right now. Uh, so, mind body approaches, and one example is mindfulness based stress reduction. Uh, there's some skills training, so to help patients and providers talk better with one another. Some cognitive behavior techniques, I think, are in almost every intervention, um, as are acceptance and commitment therapy components. And I just pulled three of the randomized control trials um, that um, are being conducted now, or there's some evidence for where they've shown some effects, and those are conquer fear, fortitude, and the breath intervention, and there are many others. Um, it's really the field is rapidly, rapidly growing um, with more and more um, randomized control trials and studies coming, I think, it feels like every week. Um, so I wanted to transition now just um, uh, that I don't think everybody needs a fear of cancer recurrence intervention to get some relief from uncertainty and worry. And I thought we'd just run through a few um, ideas that I think have been helpful uh, to patients and families that I've worked with in the past. Um, so, uh, and I'll also preface to say that these are ideas, these aren't lists of things that everybody should do and you should try everything on it. I think, unfortunately, one of the hard things about um, sort of uncertainty and worry and fear is that it's figuring out what is going to be most, what, what really is causing my fear? Is it a number of things? Can I do anything about them? And I think finding the things that you can take action with and trying to address a few things at a time is is or may be a sort of a helpful strategy. So if you find yourself really wondering and being worried about the recurrence and you haven't had a conversation with a provider about it, that might be a helpful, a helpful next step. So questions to consider if you're wondering. Again, if you're not wondering, just ignore it. But is it possible the cancer may come back? When is it most likely to come back? 
how likely is it to come back, if you want numbers or statistics. And if you would find any of those points reassuring, then I think it might be helpful to schedule an appointment and do that. So get the facts. Second is take care of your body. And there's no new information here. And it's not a suggestion that you do everything on the list. But if there's something that you feel like you could get a little bit more control over or schedule or contain, um, and that would bring some support for you in the day-to-day, -day, then I definitely think that's worth pursuing. And I think of everything on this list, sleep is by far the most important thing. It affects our mood, our concentration, um, and it's, uh, it, can be, it can be a very uh, useful intervention without, um, uh, for some, not too much work. Um, there's great apps and other things with strategies to try. Um, pay attention to emotions. I think a lot of times when we're feeling uncertain or afraid or worried, we tend to like say, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be feeling that way or I just wish it would go away or we do strategies that ignore it. And I think if we can acknowledge um, and pay attention to how we're feeling, um, I think that can go a long way to um, sort of providing a little bit of relief even if it's, if it's moment, uh, a moment in time. Um, and then trying self-talk. So I think for some people this, this feels a little hokey, but I've seen it be extremely effective um, depending on what your worry is. But um, things to say if it resonates for you. If it doesn't resonate for you, then it, it wouldn't help ever. It might even make things worse. But just to think about um, if you, uh, if you're, if you uh, hit your knee on a table and then the next day your, your knee is bothering you and you're like, oh, my goodness, my knee is bothering me. I wonder what's going on, that you could – self-talk yourself or try to provide some reassurance, which is, I had my knee on the table yesterday. I think that's what this is. If this continues in two weeks, I'm going to go to my doctor about it. Um, that you can put an alarm in your calendar so you know you won't forget about it, but that you can help, hopefully help yourself redirect your angst in the moment to, to reassuring yourself that you have a plan, you know what you're going to do. It makes sense that your knee hurts, but if it still hurts and it shouldn't, you're, you are going to follow up with your doctor. And here are just some other other examples, um, calling a friend, uh, realizing that you have people that you can rely on, um, also to, uh, to consider planning for distraction. I think that's an incredibly useful strategy. Very um, Sometimes I think people, it's underutilized because people think it's bad, but I think it's really helpful when you're in the intensity of feeling worried or afraid that you try to get a break for yourself. So. Um, zoning out and watching a good television show or a bad television show, um, reading a good book, um, trying to escape uh, with a phone call or going to dinner, getting a pedicure, do, doing something for yourself that sort of takes you out of um, your current situation and your frame of mind. So finally, I'm just going to wrap up thinking about next steps um, and uh, questions, research questions that I have and others have um, in moving, continuing to move the field forward. So I think we really need to continue to advocate probably for a very long time uh, that we need patient and family-centered care. I think it's starting to happen more, but it certainly doesn't happen everywhere, and it doesn't, uh, even in the places where it happens more consistently, it's not always, uh, I think, the level of um, sort of focus that we would really want between patients and providers. I think relatedly and very much to the mission of NCCS is really wanting quality cancer for all across the cancer care continuum, so including survivorship care in that, improvements in patient-provider communication. I'm going to skip forward for just a second and then say here that we need uh, to make sure that we're continuing to advocate for psychosocial concerns to be assessed and addressed. So more and more in the psychological view of mandates, we're, we're uh, screening for distress, but we don't always know what to do when people are saying they're distressed. So now we have more information that certain psychosocial concerns are problems, but we're still not able really to intervene in be helpful in meaningful ways. And then the, the fourth item that I'm saying last here is uh, preparing patients and families for psychosocial side effects. So I think this is a research question I have too, which is how can we, how can we prepare patients and families, and honestly, I think to some extent providers to be um, aware that psychosocially you may, you may have fear and that would be normal. I think so many times we don't acknowledge the, the struggles that we know happen for so many people and then they're happening and people feel alone or feel like they shouldn't be having it because if, you know, if it was normal, my doctor would have told me instead of 
there's a whole world out there feeling the same way and we don't we don't share that information or prepare people with how to cope when hard things happen. Um, and then these researchers research questions about can we or how can we prevent clinical levels of severe cancer occurrence? How do we most or how do we identify patients and families most at risk? And what are the best treatment interventions to address fear of cancer occurrence? I want to just quick, quickly acknowledge um, my mentor, Janice Bell, and uh, my co-authors on the paper, uh, Louisa Nekladov, Diana Migliaretti, Nathan Fairman, Jill Joseph, and a colleague of mine, Julie Baird, um, and thank you all for your time. And I will leave you with um, another, uh, another patient quote, uh, who is a bone marrow transplant patient uh, two years out from a second transplant. It is about change, about grieving for expected futures, finding strength amidst darkness, self-discovery, searching for meaning, reevaluating who I am and who and what is important to me, looking for hope and finding ways to cope with the unknown. It is hard, wonderful, and always surprising. So thank you all. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. Really appreciate it. Um, we got some several questions coming in here that we wanted just to uh, jump right in with. Uh, first of all, Kelly uh, writes, uh, my diagnosis is stage four ovarian cancer. I'm on maintenance treatment after one recurrence. I will always be either in active treatment or maintenance. It's not a question of whether recurrence will occur, but how long will I have before it occurs? There's no sense of being a survivor. What tips do you have for dealing with long-term fear of recurrence that you know could come at any time, the sense that this will never be over? And how do you deal with family or friends who think uh, NED makes me cancer free? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think what's hard. I th I'll start with the end there. The expectations that that family and friends have is, I think, it's unfortunate that I think often the people who are having um, having difficulty or having um, having health challenges are often the burden is on you to try to explain what's happening. But I think some ways to, if you have one or two friends or a family member who could be the lead and sort of getting the the message out, um, I think that can be sort of a helpful strategy to try to mitigate some of the, the expectations that family and friends may have. But I think your, I think your earlier question, um, I think from my understanding of what Dan was reading is that you don't feel like the survivor um, uh, name fits for you because it's something, it's not a matter of, um, it's not a matter of when, but or it is a matter of when, it's not that it, it may not come back. And I think the strategies that I said um, that I just went through are all applicable. It's, uh, I think it's this uncomfortable sort of knowing um, that uh, things are uncertain. I think when I was in clinical practice, I talked with a lot of um, patients and families that I that it's unfortunate that I think cancer survivors have a different awareness of the vulnerability that we that we all have, and it's an intensity that is, I think, different and um, it's more challenging in the day to day. But those uh, uh, to to find ways to sort of protect yourself or or to create a plan, like if you have to go in for a scan, or I'm not sure. Um, the things that might be triggering for you, but to, to try to protect yourself the best you can and make plans. Well, I know that I'm going to have a really hard time like two days before and the week after my scan, so I'm going to make sure that I build in X, Y, and Z and be, you know, intense and, and distracting yourself if that's a helpful strategy. Um, I think MBSR, the mindfulness-based stress reduction, just as a, as a plan of day-to-day -day life, I think it's been very effective for people. Um, I think there's some, in, in that, there's also some really helpful cognitive behavioral therapy techniques that can be useful. Um, and again, this is about management, uh, management of fear, management of uncertainty, um, depending on what your triggers are. I think it has to be individualized based on um, what is, you know, what are the, sort of what your path to fear is. I don't know if that's making sense. Is that helpful? Yeah, definitely. Um, we got a couple questions also about um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned something about um, optimism and fear of recurrence and just wanted to see if you could kind of unpack that a little bit more. Sure. So the optimism, so the being, I think for a lot of people who are um, 
for sort of positive uh, in in their personality that they feel hopeful and positive sort of just generally for who they are. I don't think that's who this optimism is referring to. I think the I used to give this um, talk when I was at Dana Farber called the the pressures of being positive, and I think there's a lot of um, pressure, <laughs> um, but expectation to that um, you have to be positive. If you're not positive, it's um, you're going to make yourself sick or you're going to get sicker. And I think that hopefulness of um, this pressure to be positive, that I'm going to be hopeful about my future, is actually functions more as like a, a way of holding on tightly to something, that it's still, um, I think it's, it's anxiety in a different form. Um, not to say that it's not pure optimism, but I think it's um, tainted, seems strong, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of affected by the holding tightly and not wanting to let go. Um, and that that sort of is, is where the fear is, like that if I let go from being very positive and very hopeful, if I let a thought enter my mind that uh, I'm worried or that I'm, I'm sad because things aren't how I wanted my life to be, that somehow that takes away from the optimism. So holding on tightly to that, I think is, is that is what I think is very, very paralleled and connected to people having high fear of cancer occurring. Lots of questions coming in here. Uh, one from Amy. Are uh, researchers looking at cancer survivorship as a type of trauma? You know the effects of trauma on the brain. I sometimes feel like I'm in a chronic state of trauma even almost two years post uh, stem cell transplant. I'm totally functional, but the fear can feel overwhelming. So yes, I think people are definitely, researchers are definitely looking at aspects of fear of cancer recurrence as having um, components of post-traumatic stress disorder or certainly at a minimum post-traumatic stress symptoms. So for example, uh, common things uh, that we talked about like our triggers, so um, seeing something on the television that is about cancer or you get a flash or a reminder of something that is a definitely an overlap between FCR and PTSD. Um, intrusive thoughts are also an area of overlap. Um, but I think that there are many, so PTSD and, and anxiety are, those are, those are anxiety disorders. And I think there's a lot of overlap uh, with anxiety disorders and fear of cancer occurrence. So it's being explored. But again, I think it's just, um, it, PTSD doesn't explain all of fear of cancer occurrence, which is why I think they're trying to look at things um, as, at more as concepts that make up FCR instead of it being all just PTSD or all just some sort of anxiety. Ah, interesting. Okay. Um, I have a question from Holly. Uh, can you please discuss the link between youth and increased likelihood of FCR? Also, what is young defined as in, the, uh, in regards to the research? Yeah, so young, um, I, I wasn't, um, so younger age, I think they say 42 and younger. Um, so somewhere in the early 40s and younger are people who, um, so like 18 to 42 year olds are more likely to report high FCR compared to people who are older. Um, and that's fairly consistent across most diagnoses except for a couple. Um, did that answer the question? So youth, uh, uh, so this is not child, this, these aren't childhood cancer survivors. These are adults diagnosed with cancer. Gotcha, okay. Um, and the question from Amanda, uh, when you are in active treatment, you get so much support from friends and family. I know I'm not the center of their universe, but how do you deal with insensitivity about fear of recurrence? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's the, I think this is a struggle for, um, you know, like I was just sharing the, the myths of cancer survivorship, I think um, the idea that treatment ends and everything goes back to normal is um, certainly the dominant expectation. And I think that's true not to the family and friends, but sometimes the providers too, um, and that we have of ourselves. And it's, I think one thing, uh, like I was trying to say, I, just, I think it's unfair, but I, the unfortunate truth is I think the burden lies on the people um, who are cancer survivors to, to speak their truth, to say that this, this is persisting for me or I have new challenges now. I don't think that's fair, but I think it can help. Um, I also think having, you know, more research and more sort of understanding whether it's just in the public more that we're, that this is sort of a normal and expected thing helps, but I think that, that, take, that takes longer. 
um, I, uh, I think, I don't know if this is a useful analogy, but I, um, I did some work a long time ago uh, with uh, people in the military, and I think there, I should, it seems maybe a little bit of a reach, but I think there's a lot of parallels between people in active duty and active treatment, and that we do have all these supports and all this attention, but then once you finish treatment, once you're a veteran, like the services really go away, um, and it's really, it also shifts that the burden becomes you know, if you don't show up for an appointment when you're in active treatment, people are on the phone, they're calling you, they may even come and get you at your house, which is very similar to being in active duty. But once you're finished, if you don't show up for a survivorship appointment, and a lot of people don't, <laughs> and if you don't show up for things or your follow-up appointment, there's less, there's just less intensity about it. And I think it's a hard, um, I think it's just very difficult to navigate. Very hard. I don't have any good answer. Yeah, it adds to the complexity of the issue, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Eleanor uh, writes, uh, regarding interventions, uh, what is MBSR and what are cognitive behavioral techniques? Um, you touched on it in your slides, and I believe we'll be able to make uh, the slides available on the, on the website, if that's okay with you, um, once we post things. But uh, just wanted to jump in on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so MBSR is mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn sort of the founder and leader of that. And there's some great, I mean, if you just Google MBSR or John Kabat-Zinn, um, uh, he, I think the first, like the main sort of training manual is called Full Catastrophe Living. I think it's a great, it's a great book that introduces people to MBSR. They, they have cancer survivor specific, and I could, um, again, I can email this to you too to make it available, but um, just it's a way of, I think, of mindfulness of a data establishing a day-to-day -day practice to help um, I think learn to be present with uncertainty so not sort of wishing certain feelings away and holding tightly to other feelings but a way of being more present that allows you to better manage I think the inevitable stress and uncertainty that that's just around for cancer survivors I think cognitive behavioral techniques I think borrows from some of that but it's a it's a more cognitive process so if you have an intrusive thought or you are triggered by something, it's a way of, of redirecting sort of your emotional response, emotional response um, uh, sort of in mapping that, I don't know if that makes sense. But mm -hmm. that helps. Okay. Um, we'll take one or two more questions here. Uh, Denise writes, how much does the insistent types of maintenance and surveillance post frontline uh, or other treatment exacerbate FCR? Can you say it one more time? How much? Sure. Um, it says, how much does in, uh, insistent types of maintenance and surveillance post frontline or other types of treatment exacerbate uh, fear of recurrence? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I think it just depends. Um, well, I haven't met, I don't think I've met a cancer survivor who doesn't get sort of worried and sort of have some increased fear around a follow up appointment um, to get a scan. So I think. There are some things that are just universally anxiety producing and upsetting. But I think there are other things that are uh, very, and based on your own experience, that uh, might be a trigger, might be a, a trigger for you. So um, I think it's easier, you know, for some people out of sight, out of mind. So if you're not going to follow up with appointments or you're not doing things that make you think about your cancer experience, I think that could. Um, be sort of a relief. I think for other people, the not dealing with it or not feeling like you're being surveilled, you know, like they, someone's watching your disease and watching to make sure everything's okay, um, if that wasn't happening, that could be very anxiety producing. So a lot of it is um, knowing, like learning to know what am I really upset about um, and then trying to make a plan that is focused on those fears or those worries. It's not a one size. I think there are a lot of there are a lot of different pathways to why people have fear of cancer recurrence. So it is, I think, almost ubiquitous. But the degree to which it is bothersome to people and how you arrive there, I think, is varied. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, I just want to remind folks: if you have questions, put them in the uh, chat box. We'll try to get to as many as we can. 
Um, I just had a question real quick. Um, you mentioned in your research about the 11% uh, uh, of folks saying in the survey that they had high um, levels of fear recurrence, and that in something that we discussed and something that just caught my attention. Can you just unpack that a little bit? Because it's a little bit against of what I would have guessed, I guess. Because you would have expected that it would be higher? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, me too. So I think that so there's a couple of, there's a couple maybe more than a couple limitations with survey research. And one is, okay, so number one, uh, this, is, this is one question um, about fear of cancer occurrence, and it's at one point in time. So, for example, if we asked everybody what's your, you know, what's your level or worry or concern about um, your cancer returning, like the day before a follow-up appointment where they had to get a scan, we might get very different response than we would if it's scattered all about. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that explains why that number is what it is. Um, but there are other reasons too. And so the sample, it's, and so who are you asking in survey research? And so this tried to be a representative sample, but it includes people who are newly, newly finishing treatment and people who are many, many years out. So if you're many, many years out, and I'm saying 10 or 15 years out, you may not be having as many follow-up appointments. Cancer may be less of your life than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. That's not always true, but it may be true. So if more people are in that group answering a certain way, then that also may affect the number of people reporting high. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, any other mm -hmm. questions? Um, oh, here's a question that Jay just sent in. Uh, in doing studies of FCR, it might be helpful to ask participants what they think contributes to their fear of and what, if anything, they would find helpful. Different cancers have different recurrence patterns, and that needs to be part of the picture. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. I think that is happening, um, and it, it, I think it's essential. I think I'll add to say that um, you would think that you know cancers that have certain cancers that are more likely to recur, um, and I think some other things that might get at severity uh, would be predictive of high fear of cancer recurrence, and it's not. So there, there aren't. Um, so the stage of your cancer does not predict high fear of cancer recurrence. The kind of cancer you have doesn't predict high fear of cancer recurrence. Interesting. Mm. There, there are other, I agree with you that it matters immensely, but there are other things that are happening that um, there's something else in addition to that that is happening where people are reporting, among the people who report a high fear of cancer recurrence. Yeah, uh, yeah, huh, interesting. Um, and Sherry raises a good question. Do you see higher levels of stress among cancer advocates? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I that I have I don't know, um, but I think again, like with any of this, which is sort of unhelpful, but just the reality is, I think it de it depends. So if you find meaning in being an advocate, and it's um, you know it's a way of sort of contributing or helping make sense of what you've been through, a way of sharing with others, and that is. You know, I could see how that could outweigh any sort of triggering aspect. But if you find those things all to be true, but every time you talk about cancer, you get afraid, I see how that could be, being an advocate could be problematic and um, you might, that might create some more increased levels of stress. I think it could go either way, just depending on, on the individual and the experience. Yeah. Completely agree. Um, and then I just had one question for you as well. Um, you said the clinical definition of fear recurrence is kind of a day-to-day -day disruption. I, I find disruption kind of difficult to wrap my head around. So, kind of, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, what I mean. just what that means and and what the kind of the, the barrier is, I guess. Yeah. So when I was talking about like it's like a level of disruption or level of bother, I mean that. Is fear, is the level of fear affect your ability to go to work, disrupt your daily activities? Does it affect your ability to get on the phone and talk with a friend? 
does it do you have so many intrusive thoughts that you can't focus that you're not able to concentrate on things um, that it you know you can't you're not able to do the things that you want to do day to day because of your fear and that might manifest itself in like I just said intrusive thoughts that you know maybe it interrupts your sleep when you're so tired because in the day to day because you aren't able to sleep at night because you're so you know angst, you know you're angst ridden or um, but the that the it's the day like that your day to day activities are so affected. Um, that's what I mean by like disruption and bother. Is that clear or no? Yeah, no, that definitely helps. Thank you. Um, all right, last call for any any questions. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, again, we'll get this out as soon as we can and uh, send us feedback in the meantime, and uh, we will be in touch with uh, future webinars webinars as soon as possible. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Reed. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.